Afra and Eisman, and uh, I'm an Australian Jew um, who's been to Israel. So do I count for all categories plus one? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Many times to Israel. Um, so what I'll be talking about is, um, is the psychology of fashion. Very important subject. Probably not as important as what we just heard, but it's important. Um, <laughs> And I have to say, <laughs> I'm like, damn, I'm going to have to go after, after the comedian. <laughs> oh, we'll keep it in the same vein. Anyway, um, so the psychology of fashion. And, um, and you know, coming here tonight, I didn't know what to expect because I, I hadn't, hadn't come before and I'm definitely coming again. And I was so excited to see so many incredibly stylish, well-dressed people in the crowd, at least most of you. <laughs> So, you know, when you got dressed this morning or this evening for tonight, you know, what kind of thought process went through your head? You know, did you think, all right, as I've seen in some cases, you know, I'm single and ready to mingle? Or did you think, you know, any mums in the room that have gone, all right, it's time to start making love and not sandwiches? Um, <laughs> but whatever it is, whether it be conscious or subconscious, there is a very important and fairly significant thought process that goes on in our minds. Um, why we pick one item above all else um, in a world of infinite choices at every price point reveals a great deal about our um, sense of humour, in some people's outfits case, <laughs> our sense of self uh, and multiple sensibilities, our value system, where we've come from, what we aspire to. There are multiple of things. And so I, my two books that I've written, one which uh, just came out recently, my recent one is called How to Tell a Woman by Her Handbag and, one, and the other one's called How to Tell a Man by His Shoes. And it really delves into the psychology of fashion and why we pick certain items over others and what that reveals about us. And sometimes it is frightening. <laughs> um, so, so basically, I very much believe that we reveal ourselves in details. You know, it's not the grand declarations about who we say we are. It's not what we tell the people we love most in our lives, that's for sure. Sorry about that, <laughs> if you're close to me. Um, it's, it's the things that we don't think anyone else will notice. In fact, um, it's not even what we tell ourselves. You know, the human species is the only one that we know of that operates in a semi-constant state of self-delusion. And that is true. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, they did a study that was uh, recently came out from the Journal of Basic and Applied um, Philosophy, um, Psychology, sorry. And it found that 60% of people in a 10 minute period will lie at least once. <laughs> the average is 2.92 uh, uh, times. So if I'm speaking for seven minutes, that means that I will lie on average 2.1 times and I might have already done one of them. <laughs> so yes, take it with a grain of salt. No, I'm just kidding. So basically, the ability to be able to read people's outfits is very useful. I say it kind of I just kind of describe it as body language with like a label attached to it. Um, so I'm going to kind of explore a few of the kind of um, important parts of understanding uh, the fashion that we wear and, and how that reveals a lot about us. But you know, what should we start off with? Something that we all can relate to, particularly the women. Should we start with shoes? Yes. <laughs> Let's start with shoes. Guys, have a look at my shoes behind. Have a look. What do you think? You like them? No, I can just do that. Thank you. <laughs> That's got nothing to do with the speech. I just <laughs> that just paid for them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Basically, um, women will do anything for a pair of shoes. Okay, women will do anything for a pair of shoes. Apparently, um, they'll do even more for a pair of red-heeled Christian Louboutin shoes. Yes. I will do anything for a pair of Christian Louboutin shoes. You can ask the um, sale assistant at uh, Saks Fifth Avenue who has a restraining order against me. <laughs> and a well-deserved one, let me just say I earned it. Um, women will do anything and uh, because it's the ultimate kind of symbol of beauty and, and power and status and you know, it lifts the derriere and does so much for us um, that n nothing else can. But whilst Christian Louboutin uh, was a very clever French man who patented this, this red heel, uh, he wasn't the first French canny uh, man to come up with such a concept. If you go back a little bit earlier to say um, the late 1600s, early 1700s to Louis XIV, that, uh, that king of France uh, inherited a monarchy that was trying to have absolute rule. 
that meant that they wanted to be um, the final stop for, for all decisions, including over the um, aristocracy of the time. So he kind of inherited this, this movement and wanted to take it one step further. So what did he do to kind of, kind of rein in his, um, the aristocrats who had so much power? What he did was he declared that only those in favour, in the favour of the king, were able to wear red heeled shoes. That's true. So if the king loved you, you got to wear them. Brilliant idea, so simple. But the fact that it was so, it was so effective because it was the ultimate advertisement for um, being loved, being powerful. So ultimately what these aristocrats did was they gave up power um, in return for, for privilege because they didn't want to advertise that they were out of favour with the king as you'll see in some, um, some paintings from the time when the, some of the key people aren't wearing them. So they gave up power for privilege which is something that I've done. I've given up the power to walk over to that side of the room without pain um, for the privilege of wearing these shoes. And some of you might have seen that earlier. <laughs> Don't laugh so hard. <laughs> So, um, so that, that's what that's what's happened. So, so fashion, as you'll say, as you'll see, is very much reflective of the psychology of the time and um, and the status and the emotions, and it can be used to really encapsulate our power and and to rule, um, whether it be on the runway or in a um, 16th century uh, uh, kingdom in in France. And, uh, and you'll see this hasn't changed today. In fact, if you go not far from here up to Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood, there's still a lot of men coming out of the closet wearing red heels, trying to win the favor of the king, and it must be working because I believe they're called queens. Is that <laughs> um, so, you know, if we look through history, we'll see that fashion has very much reflected the, um, the the philosophy and, and the society of its time. We can look at corsets and corsetry as a binding of um, women. And, and when you kind of, um, and actually back in ancient um, times, men and even children wore corsets. Did you know that? I'd like to see some men in some corsets. I might see that back on the Santa Monica Boulevard. <laughs> um, but, um, and when you restrict someone's physical freedom, you also restrict their actual freedom. So it's really interesting. It's a very physical um, explanation of it. You look at hemlines. Have you guys heard about um, the hemline index? Yes? Okay, this is very interesting. Um, an, an economist called George Taylor in 1926 came up with a theory where you could match the, the height of a hemline with the economic strength of the time. So basically when hemlines went up, so did the stock market. It's true. And basically the theory being, which was proven and was a bangable method at the time, was that when people were willing to pay more money for less, <laughs> in my case, I actually was okay tonight, but it's been shorter. <laughs> Basically, that's saying that um, there's a certain kind of a fiscal confidence that is associated with that. And, um, and so when it went down, people were holding onto their rations, going for warmth. And so you could actually trace the economic stability of the time based on the flux of a girl's hemline. You've got to love that. You know, the psychology of fashion is very um, Freudian to think about the subconscious mind being the contents of your bag. Some things that you know, some things you don't. In fact, you know, they did a study and it showed that 70% of women would freak out if their husband, boyfriend or best friend looked inside their handbag without asking their permission. I guess if we don't know what's in the bag, why should anyone else, right? <laughs> but the truth is, is that um, the exterior of a bag, in fact the word, the word purse itself comes from a 17th century word which uh, was slang for uh, a part of a female genitalia. Did you know that? You'll reconsider buying someone a purse this Christmas Hanukkah season. <laughs> so, um, so yes, the bag itself is very much a reflection of us outside and inside, our internal and our external worlds as women. But let's kind of trace it back. We talked a little bit hi about hieroglyphics. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of decoding fashion for you as a reflection of what's going on in society and in, in people's minds. The first um, signs of handbags actually appeared in ancient Egypt. 
and um, Galit would have been very excited to hear about this. Um, but it was worn by men, and there were more pouches that were worn around the waist. Um, and in the Bible, I mean, uh, I can ask the rabbi, remember, there's references to handbags or purses. In the Middle Ages, with a concept where Western fashion really came into its own and really was born, they were heavily gem encrusted bags. They were, you know, all about status because obviously this reflected that you had a lot of money and that you could get away with carrying a bag like this. So the fact, and what's interesting is that it wasn't your money, it was a way of the father or the husband of the woman wearing it to show off. So they carried this to say, hey, just as you're another accessory for that accessory. Much like the Hermes Birkin bag today is very much a don't mess with me kind of bag. In fact, they cost about you know, six months pay and six months on a waiting list to receive one. So the women that buy these bags, even if they're in this really ugly shade of plum, they hold on to these old bags until they become one. It's true. Um, then if you go into the roaring 20s, you know, this is a fabulous time for women. It was, you know, the flapper generation of women finally could get rid of the chaperone and replace it with a handbag because they, they serve the same purpose. They could carry their money in it. It's true. <laughs> maybe a cigarette, maybe not, depending if you're from Israel or not, <laughs> or LA. And, um, and finally, they had an accessory that paid for dinner but did not answer back. And that was a big thing for us. And then during the you know, World War I and II, you know, there were definite leather shortages. So brands were using the cane handle bag, which is you know, Gucci's symbol right now. That's their, their kind of iconic bag. And that, was, um, that came because they ran out of leather. So it actually became a symbol of being very much um, glamorous under fire, which is really the ultimate thing. Also, red lipstick goes up at those times as well. And then the 60s, it's a free love in 60s. Anyone been, anyone was around then? <laughs> Don't tell me now, you can tell me later in a quiet moment with some dim lighting. No, I'm just kidding. But um, no, the 60s was a time where was a, uh, women's liberation movement was in full swing. And so bags became that kind of very slouchy, bohemian, boho shape, which is very popular again today. And um, that reflected the kind of loosening up of, of of the psychology for women at that day. And, and just as um, the bags were slouchy, thanks to the burning of the bras, so were our breasts. And um, those went hand in hand. And then the 80s, I know we're there. I was born in the 80s. It was about power dressing. You know, suits were sharp, bags were sharp. And it was really reflective of the briefcase of the time. You know, the Chanel 2.55 bag made a, you know, Resurrection because it looked like, you know, it's a, a woman in a man's world. We may as well dress like men before we realize that women are much better being women than pretending to be men. So, um, and now, I mean, bags are huge. Let me have a look at the bags. Can we see some bags? Can we just see a few bags? Any big bags? It's big, it's big. I've seen bigger, it's bigger. <laughs> Imagine I was talking about men at this point. Yes, that's very big. Um, and um, so bags get bigger, our lives become multifaceted. We wanted it all and we got it all. So our bags need to reflect that in size. In fact, bags are so big this year that I'm convinced that this year's bag ate last year's. Um, they're that big. Um, so what I really want us to explain is that when you walk through life or, and you see people on the street, whether you acknowledge it or not, we're taking clues from what they're wearing that go back to ancient Egypt and, and go deep into their closet and into their subconscious mind and we take messages from that. And the same thing is happening when people look at you. So whether it be on a first date, a job interview, or just going out to get a coffee in the corner of um, Starbucks. Uh, it's so important to be aware about the message that we send so that we always send the message we want, even if it's not what anyone else wants. <laughs> anyway, so I just want to thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs>